Let me ask, how many people in this room have been married between zero and 10 years? Anybody? Zero and 10 years. Okay. How about 11 to 20 years marriage? That's a big part of it. All right, Lance, see who you got. 21 to 30 years. That's me. 31 to 40 years. A healthy group of people. How many, Strutzy? It's a good question, Jay. Oh. <laughs> 39. Is he right, Janice? Okay, good. 41 to 50 years. Nice, nice, nice. That's big. Is there anybody over 51 years? Honesies, would you stand up, please? Let's congratulate the Holmesies. Isn't that awesome? Sweetheart, you are a saint, I'm telling you. <laughs> That's good. All right. Welcome to Minister and Spouse Day. You have two sessions here this morning and a break in between. And so snuggle up to each other, even the Moyers back there, snuggle up. <laughs> How many of you remember Lance Witt from four years ago? Okay, how many don't know him from a hole in the wall? Okay, all right, Lance, Lance Witt has written several books of which one is one of my favorites called Replenish. He specializes in helping folks like us remember that our soul is important and he helps us Remember to take care of our own soul. Our marriages, our ministry soul is not, our, our ministry soul is not what it's all about. Okay? And this guy has been through a lot. He's been a head pastor for 20 years. He was part of Rick Warren's Saddleback Church. Anybody heard of that? Remember the 40 days of purpose? Um, it, it was like a landslide going through. He was the executive pastor of Saddleback Church during that time. He has spoke with us before. He's been married 40 years, so he's got some good experience with that. And Connie, your wife, is here with us today. Is that right? But not this morning? No, she's, she'll, she should be. She's a, <laughs> Understood. Yeah, and so I also need to let you know that there are sign-up slots if you would like individual time with either Lance or with Connie, the sign-up slots are for this afternoon and they're on the table out here in the hallway. So if you want individual time with Lance or your spouse wants individual time with Connie and she's a gal, then, then you can sign up for those in the lobby there. So let's open with prayer and then we'll have Lance Witt come forward. Lord, again, we're asking for a gold nugget today from you something that will, will really, Lord, propel us closer to you and closer to our spouses and, and help us, Lord, as we walk this journey. We'll give you all the praise and all the glory and all the honor. Let's give a nice welcome to Lance Witt as he comes up to share. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, it is uh, great to be with you guys. I... Uh, I'm so grateful for Brian inviting me to come back. I, I rarely get invited back anywhere, so this is a, this is a real treat. And uh, I appreciate you guys. You know, I've, I've worked over the last, I don't know, eight or nine years with several churches in your conference, and um, I am up an honor. Is that my, am I doing something bad? Is this working or no? Yeah, that's Okay. All right. It's always great working through these technical problems. Um, but I have an ongoing uh, working relationship with Harvest Church in Billings with uh, Vern Streeter and the, the staff there. And so I have really grown to love um, you guys through the years. And I, I was thinking about that this morning and just feeling like, you know, in a lot of ways, you guys are really like my tribe. And uh, I, I love kind of who you are and just the way that you do ministry and the way that you love the Lord. And so I want to share with you a couple of sessions this morning that 
are really flow out of my own personal journey. And I'll share with you a little bit of my story as we go along. But uh, as Jay mentioned, I was a senior pastor for 20 years. And then for seven years, I worked at Saddleback Church during those years when um, 40 Days of Purpose came out. Rick wrote the book Purpose Driven Life. And as you guys know, that was just a tsunami of influence and opportunity that came uh, when he wrote that book. Feel free, just jump right in there. <laughs> Am I gonna use this? Oh, okay. Um, so when Rick wrote the book, 40 Days of Purpose, um, it just was such a game changer for him and for our entire staff. He became a global celebrity and um, you know he was in demand and opportunities were unprecedented for a, you know, a Christian leader. And so um, while it was an intoxicating and exhilarating ride, it was also um, a lot of chaos and the pace of my life was out of control. And it was really in that season that I got to an unhealthy place and was not uh, living life like I really wanted to live it, like I knew God wanted me to live it. And so after seven years of being there, came to a place where I decided I can't stay. Like I knew that this was not good for me and I couldn't thrive in ministry on the path that I was on. And so I stepped down uh, in late 2006 and not sure what I was gonna do. Um, I assumed I was gonna go and just be a senior pastor again. It's what I was comfortable with. It's what I'd known for all those years. And it was actually my wife in one of our conversations that said to me, you know, I think you ought to be open to God doing something else in your life right now. I mean, he may lead us back to pastoring, but what you've been through, God may have something else in mind. And so I, I just sort of sat with that and I was doing different project work for different ministries and churches and I was doing some speaking and um, was on a long plane ride to Singapore uh, to speak at a conference and it was the middle of the night and everybody on the plane was asleep and it was just one of those moments where I was just wrestling with God. And I was confused. Here I am in my mid-40s, and I'm not sure what I'm going to be when I grow up. And so I just was wrestling with the Lord. And I remember crying out to the Lord that night in just my own prayer time. Um, and I just said, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Have you ever asked God a question but not expect an answer? Well, that's how I pray a lot. But in this moment, um, and I've had very few mystical experiences, but it was one of those moments where God met me so powerfully and so clearly. And as I asked that question, the answer from the Lord came back. I want you to help pastors and leaders be healthy, holy, and humble. And I remember thinking to myself, I could give my life to that. And I would describe to you that the last 12 years of my life, in many respects, have been trying to understand how to bring my own soul back to life and how to do ministry from a healthy place. And so what I want to talk to you in this first session this morning is how do you do ministry without losing your soul? Um, I've, I've been a Christ follower for 45 years and I've been in ministry now right at 40 years. And even when I say that to you, it's just hard to believe. It feels surreal that I've been in ministry that long. But my mind races back all the way to when I was a junior high kid and I went on my very first student retreat at a Baptist retreat center called Glorieta in, in New Mexico, outside of Santa Fe, New Mexico. And it was my first time to ever kind of be at a student retreat. And I remember it was late on a Friday night and after all the sessions and stuff had been done and the singing and the games and all that, before we dismissed for the evening, our youth pastor asked us to get in little groups and they assigned us into these groups to go and pray with one another to kind of finish off the night. And I'll never forget that two of the people in my group were high school seniors that I really looked up to as a seventh grader. Their names were Gary and Alba Wilcox. And we went out and, and they had brought a friend with them to that student retreat. And it was, I remember a perfect fall evening, uh, moonlit night. We sat around this tree and sort of the tree well around this tree. And before we began to pray, Gary and Alba began to share the gospel with their friend that they had brought. And obviously they had already had this discussion before and this kid's heart was already open because as they began to share the gospel, he immediately leaned in. And in just a few minutes, he said, I'm, I'm ready. And so right there, sitting around that tree at 10.30 at night, 
he was led to the Lord. And that, that little tree became an altar where he gave his life to Christ. And I remember thinking as a junior high kid, I would like to help other people experience what he just experienced. And that was the first time I felt sort of this inkling of a life in ministry, like, wow, I, I, I could do this. And, and even though it was a few years later when I was a high school kid that I, I felt the call of God and surrender my life to ministry, I remember kind of that feeling of I, I could give my life to this. And in fact, when I did finally surrender to, the, to ministry, I, I couldn't imagine doing anything else with my life. And as I reflect back now, 40 years ago, to when I first started in ministry, here are some words I would use to describe my love for Christ. I would say that my love for Christ was pure, naive, simple, very passionate, and what felt like in that time, very wholehearted. Um, and like all of us in all kinds of relationships that we've ever been in, the last four decades of my life in ministry have had a lot of uh, relational ups and downs. And where I sit today at age 59, having been in ministry for 40 years, I would tell you that now those words don't often describe my relationship with Christ because the truth is, as I reflect back on 40 years of ministry, my love for Christ hasn't always been pure. If I'm honest, there are times when my motives get mixed up and somehow my motives of even serving Christ and leading in the church end up being more about me than really about my love for God. And I'll tell you this for sure, my love for Christ is not naive any longer. Nothing like being 40 years in the trenches of local church ministry to have your rose-colored glasses shattered about what it's like to serve Jesus. And then I would say that my love for Christ is not simple either. Have, have you realized that ministry actually complicates what it means to love Jesus? Because what started out as a teenager, as kind of simple love just for Jesus wanting to serve him. When I became a pastor, now that love for Jesus actually turned in to a job as a pastor, shepherding people and running the organization of the church. And, um, and my love for Christ through the years sometimes has been very passionate and it's been sometimes very wholehearted. But again, if I'm just gonna be really candid with you, the truth is there have been times when my spiritual life has been stale and stuck and dry and where I have personally felt disconnected from Jesus. And the truth is sometimes my people pleasing tendencies and my you know, um, ambition to grow the church and sometimes you know, financial insecurities and my compulsive, 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 busyness, compulsive busyness, all those took a toll on my passion and love for Christ. And here's what else I know to be true. There's nothing worse than trying to inspire people to be passionate about Jesus when the truth is in your own heart, you're not very passionate right now. There's nothing harder than trying to help other people connect to God when the truth is that you feel like being disconnected from God. Now, I want to tell you, I'll give you an illustration of this that every pastor in the room can relate to. It's a Sunday morning, you're on your way to go preach and you have a fight with your wife. And you don't have time to resolve the, the argument, right? and to help her know how wrong she was, you, you, you gotta get on to church. And so you pull up in the parking lot and you put on your pastor face and you shake hands and you greet people and you pray with people and you shepherd people and you preach and you kind of fake it till you make it, right? And then you get back in the car and you realize that what you've just portrayed publicly isn't necessarily what you were feeling privately. And that's been true for me sometimes spiritually. And, you know, I think as I stand here this morning at 40 years into ministry, I just have a, a much more realistic seasoned view of what it looks like to do ministry. And if you've been serving longer in ministry than a week, you know that serving in ministry is not just all Holy Ghost goosebumps and leading people to Christ around a tree on a moonlit fall night. That's just not the reality. I remember reading a few years ago what Henry Nouwen said about as he approached into his 50s, what ministry began to feel like. And here's what he said. I began to experience a deep inner threat. As I entered my 50s and was able to realize the unlikelihood of doubling my years, I came face to face with the simple question, did becoming older bring me closer to Jesus? 
After 25 years of priesthood, he says, I found myself praying poorly, living somewhat isolated from other people, and very much preoccupied with burning issues. Everyone was saying that I was doing really well, but something inside me was telling me that my success was putting my own soul in danger. And I suspect that maybe you can relate to it. Maybe it's not the same specific issues that he brings up, but we can relate to that feeling of being in ministry for a while and sort of feeling a little bit like, man, I'm not sure I'm doing this as well as I want. It doesn't feel like I'm as connected to Christ as I want to be. And so I think a good question for all of us to ponder is that question, as you get older and serve in ministry longer, what's the trajectory of your soul? If you stay on the path you're on now, and you make it to retirement as, as a minister, are you closer to Jesus? You know, and the truth is, for a lot of my ministry, those issues weren't even on my radar because I remember back in my 20s and 30s and sometimes in my 40s, I was preoccupied with growing my, our church and impacting our community and you know, recruiting volunteers and managing the budget and preparing sermons and overseeing the programs of our church. And if you would have pressed hard on me, I would have said, absolutely, I know that my highest calling is to pursue Jesus and to know him with all the intimacy that I can muster. But if you had done an audit of my life and looked at how I spent my time, what I talked about, what I thought about, what would have been revealed is that my deepest longings were really about ministry success. And so I think in ministry, we live with this tension, right? We have a calling from God, an assignment about what our churches are supposed to do and how we're to impact our communities. And yet at the same time, I have this issue of self-leadership and am I leading myself well when it comes to really pursuing Christ? And so we live with these tensions. And if you have your notes in front of you, you can uh, see there that I put some of those tensions that we live with right there in your notes. It's the tension between doing and being between caring for others and yet the need to sometimes care for ourselves, waiting on God versus working for God, praying versus planning, preparing spiritual meals for others versus feeding ourselves. How about this one? Measurable deliverables, right? Like is our attendance growing? Is our budget up? Are more people coming to Christ? Versus the unmeasurable work of the spirit. The issue of breadth growing our churches larger and having greater impact in our communities, but also the issue of death. Are we actually helping our people really follow Christ and become disciple-making disciples? And then the issue of God working in us versus God working through us. Now, here's what I want you to hear me say clearly. All of these tensions, it's not an either or. It's not one side or the other. It really is a both and. In fact, only embracing one side of the tension either leads to dysfunction or a lopsided view of ministry. It really does. And I think in our generation, in the 21st century, if I would observe the church over the last generation, the gravitational pull for those of us in ministry is to focus on the doing side, the driving side, the growing side. And none of those are negative, unless they, they cause you to neglect kind of your own personal pursuit of loving Jesus. You see, a life focused only on the doing and achieving side will lead to distorted motives and a skewed view of success. I love the words of Ruth Haley Barton, and if you've never read her book, Strengthening the Soul of Your Leadership, it's a fabulous read. But in her book, she says, it is possible to gain the world of ministry success and lose your own soul in the midst of it all. So I wanna be really clear this morning, I believe 40 years in, that the greatest gift that you will ever give your church is your own healthy soul. Beyond your ability to preach, beyond your ability to skillfully lead, beyond your ability to you know, shepherd people, the greatest gift that you will ever give your church is your own healthy soul. And for so many years of my ministry, I was so focused on leading and shepherding everybody else and growing the church and recruiting volunteers that often I neglected leading myself and ended up being disconnected from my relationship with God. But part of my leadership is self-leadership. Look at 2 Corinthians 3 there in your notes I put. Um, Paul writes, by the way, this verse is not just for those you lead, it's also for you. 
He says, we all who with unfailed faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is his spirit. Uh, one author says that spiritual transformation is the process, listen to this, by which Christ is formed in us for the glory of God, for the abundance of our lives, we, we get better and blessed when our lives are transformed. And then he says, and for the sake of others. I want that to be true in my life, that I'm experiencing transformation in my life, becoming more like Jesus so that God gets the glory, so that my life gets richer and more blessed, and also so that it will be a blessing to other people that I know. So I want to give you three thoughts kind of on which to hang um, this first session, and here they are. Number one, we must learn the skill of tending to our soul and our soul's connection with God. All right? Your soul was made by God and for God. Your, your soul longs to know God and to be in relationship with God. Like John Orberg says in his book, Soul Keeping, the neglected soul doesn't go away, it goes awry. You see, nature abhors a vacuum and an empty soul will not stay, stay empty very long. When God is not present, a host of other lesser gods will rush in to fill the space. And of all people in your local communities who ought to represent the intimacy of God and the presence of God, it is those of us who lead in ministry. It makes me think of this moment in the book of Numbers. If you remember when... Um, prior to going to the promised land, they are going to be, you know, divvying out the different um, parcels of land of the tribes of Israel. And every tribe got a parcel of land except for one, and it was the Levites. And if you remember that God would say to the Levites that I will be your inheritance. So here's the point. Where everybody else in the nation got property, the priests got presents. Now, it doesn't mean that the presence of God wasn't available to all the other tribes of Israel, but what it did mean for those who it was their vocation to serve God, there ought to be something different and unique about how they experience God, and there ought to be the aroma of the presence of God on their lives. And I don't know about you, but that resonates with me. I, what I want to be true of me as a pastor is that when people encounter me, the way I love, the way I listen, the way I talk, the things that I value, that all of those things communicate the presence of God, the aroma of God in the lives of the people that I lead. Not just that I'm a good preacher, not just that I know how to lead a congregation or organize things or manage a staff, but really it is the presence of God. And I love what A.W. Tozer says in his classic book, The Pursuit of God. He says, come near to the holy men and women of the past and you will soon feel the heat of their desire after God. All right, with that statement, I want you to listen to Paul's words in Philippians 3, because in Philippians 3, you can feel the heat of Paul's passion for God when he says, whatever was gained to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. You can feel the heat when David in Psalm 27 says, One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. So what does it look like practically? As someone who's been in ministry, a lot of us have been in ministry 10, 20, 30, 40 years. What does it look like practically for me to have this kind of vibrant walk with God where I tend my soul and I am doing ministry out of this healthy place, out of the overflow of a deep and abiding love for Jesus. What does that look like? Because here's one thing I, I know to be true out of my own life. When you try to lead in the church on empty, it always results in one of three things. Burnout, disillusionment, or cynicism. Just mark it down. People who are running on empty, who are constantly disconnected from God, who are not filling their own souls with their relationship with Jesus, they will put themselves on a path to burnout, disillusionment, or cynicism. So I, I've given this question a lot of thought because this is where I've been living the last decade or so. 
So what does it look like to do this? And, and I want to give you two super simple things, but I think they are profound in their application. So if I could say, what are the two things that are going to help you tend your soul well and live from that healthy place? Here, here's what they would be. Number, it's point number two, create unhurried space in your life to be with God. All right, so think about this for a moment. Creating time or creating space is about time and being unhurried is about temperament. Creating space is the what, unhurried is about the how. It is the, in the sacred place of unhurried space that in my heart I turn from results and doing to relationship and being. And if I don't have that unhurried time, it is hard to ever get to that place. It is in that quiet, unhurried space where God has in my life spoken the clearest and deepest. And the flip side is also true. One of the biggest barriers to us really hearing from God, and I think experiencing his presence with great depth, is because of all the busyness and clutter in our lives. That's why Dallas Willard um, makes this comment. Hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life in our day. You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. And when I was early on in my ministry, if I had read his statement, I actually would have been kind of puzzled because for me, a person who's in a hurry is a person who's on the move. A person who's in a hurry is a person who is focused and trying to accomplish something. A person in a hurry is a person who is hustling to get stuff done. And if anybody ought to be hustling, for the sake of the gospel, it's those of us who are in ministry. And so as a, as a young pastor, I would have been kind of confused by his words because how can we not be in a hurry when there is so much to be done in such a short time before Jesus returns? But the older I've gotten, the more I understand his words. Because hurry and busyness have usually been a subversive diversion in my life. And it's intoxicating to be in a hurry. It's intoxicating in there, and there's an adrenaline rush to being busy. But it often takes us away from that connection personally with God and something that my soul really longs for. And creating unhurried space isn't just about large blocks of time or, you know, chunks of solitude. It's more about, listen to this, being present and relaxed in those moments that I am being with God. And that takes its shape in all different kinds of ways. It could be, you know, that morning time that you have with God, listening prayer with your team. It could be the consistent practice of Sabbath or dedicated times of silence and solitude or personal retreat where you get away to do nothing more than just be in the presence of Jesus. And so I think if we're going to really tend to our souls, we've got to learn the discipline, which is counterintuitive in a fast-paced generation. We've got to learn the discipline of creating space in our lives. That means being intentional with our calendars and setting appointments with God just like we would other people. But then also it means that we then have to be unhurried and allow God to just speak to us. And I think when you study the history of the church, that you will find those who have the most depth in their walk with God are those who create unhurried space to just be with God. And what I know to be true of me is that the years of ministry and the more demands of ministry and the more complex ministry gets, the easier it is for all of the unhurried space to be squeezed out of my life. And so for some of us, what might need to come out of this session is to actually sit down with your calendar and go, what, what do I do about that? How, what does it look like for me to be more intentional about tending to my soul by creating unhurried space to be with God, to listen to God, and to know God? All right, let me just give you one other thought to kind of finish up this session. Integrating authentic spiritual practices into my life. So the kind of the headline is, how do I tend my soul as someone who wants to finish well in ministry? And the two kind of practices are, one, I've got to create unhurried space to be with God. And then I fill that space or I use that space to integrate authentic spiritual practices into my life. So, and again, I know we all, this is simple, this is rudimentary, but 
there's a couple of things here that have been really important for me in my own journey in these last few years. And, and here's what I'm talking about. This is an issue of both habit and heart. So think about this with me for just a moment. Spiritual habits without heart leads to legalism and hypocrisy. All right, think Pharisees. This is exactly what Jesus railed against the Pharisees for about. They had spiritual practices down, but no heart. And what they were doing externally was disconnected from who they were becoming internally. Heart without habit, on the other hand, leads to inconsistent growth and dependence on emotional experience. It is the convergence of both habit and heart that spiritual transformation takes place. Jeff Dyer in his book says, your deepest desire is the one manifested by your daily life and habits. In other words, he says, it doesn't matter what you preach about on Sunday, what songs you sing on Sunday, your deepest longings and deepest desires are revealed by your habits, by your daily habits. And okay, so here's my confession. I have found that the older I get and the longer I'm in ministry, the easier it is to be sloppy with my spiritual training. I can begin to live off of yesterday's manna or my years of ministry experience rather than sort of a fresh intimacy with Jesus. Um, one author I read recently said, learning virtue is more like practicing scales on the piano than learning music theory. In other words, it's not just about acquiring knowledge. Have you ever noticed in your life that often in life it is our love that follows the development of a habit, not the other way around? So let me give you an example. So a few months ago, I was finishing up um, writing on a new book and I was kind of up against this deadline and I was up in Vail, Colorado, working with the church that I work with up there. And uh, so when I got done with the church that afternoon, I went back to my hotel room and I thought, man, I need to get a good four or five hours of writing to try to get this deadline met. And so I ordered room service. And so I'm riding away and pretty soon, you know, there's a knock on the door and I go and answer the door and the guy's there, you know, with the tray, you, you, you know the drill. And he's got the plate with the metal, you know, cover over it. And he brings it in, he takes the metal tray off and, and, I, and because I was trying to eat right, I ordered some baked chicken and broccoli. And so this guy takes the cover off. And when I look at that, I go, that looks amazing. And then I have this kind of out of body experience in that moment. Like I'm looking above myself going, who are you? Like <laughs> that you're that excited about baked chicken and broccoli. Like there wasn't a French fry within a half a mile of that plate. And yet I was excited about it. And it was because in trying to eat right, I actually acquired a desire and a taste for that which is better for me. And I think it's so often true, whether it's exercise or whatever it is, that it is the discipline of the habit and eventually our desires begin to follow. But my experience has been after all these years of ministry, it's really easy for me to just sort of get sloppy, to get undisciplined, to no longer make it really about the habit of what I want to develop in my life. You know, when I was younger as a Christian, I used to think of spiritual disciplines as sort of the litmus test of spirituality, that you knew how spiritual you were and how much you were committed to God by how much, you know, how consistent you were in your daily quiet time and how much, you know, scripture you memorized and how many, you know, hours you spent in prayer. And like that was the litmus test of your spirituality. And, you know, I think all of us, when you grow up with sort of a legalistic view of discipleship, um, and by the way, I would describe my church's attempt to disciple me after I got saved as more behavior modification than spiritual transformation. It was all about just doing, right? Doing the right things and stop doing the wrong things. And I know that's part of my discipleship. But one of the doing things was, man, you got to spend time in the word. You got to pray. You got to, you know, exercise spiritual discipline. You got to memorize scripture. And I think when you grow up with that as your mindset, you sort of at some point react against that because it feels like legalism. And it feels like burden. And so you begin to go, you know what? My love for Jesus isn't defined by how many times this week I had my quiet time. But you also can swing the pendulum too far the other way 
to where you begin to get sloppy and undisciplined in your walk with God. And what I've realized in recent years is that spiritual disciplines are not the litmus test of my commitment or spirituality, but what they are, are the means by which God wants me to know him better. The means by which God wants me to experience him more deeply. And so my time in the word is not about getting information or thinking of new ideas for a sermon, but rather it's relational to get to know him as a person. Sabbath is not only so that I can just have a day of rest and recovery, but it's also meant to be a Sabbath unto the Lord where it is time to connect with him. Prayer is not just to intercede on the needs, on behalf of the needs of others, although that's a huge part of it. It's also so that my relationship with him gets deeper and better. So let me just finish with this passage from Deuteronomy 30. It's really become sort of a life passage for me. It's so rich. And in the first part of the final verse of the chapter, the people of God are challenged with these words, all right? So if you were to back up earlier in Deuteronomy 30, you would find the Lord with a very open hand um, inviting Israel into this abundant, amazing life. And he says, if you'll return to me, I'll prosper you, I'll bless you, I'll protect you from your enemies, I'll give you bumper crops. He says, I'll delight in you and you'll delight in me, we'll have a better relationship. And then as he he comes to the end of the chapter. Here's what he says. Now choose life. It's a choice. And I'm responsible for the kind of life I'm going to live. So that you and your children may live. And that you, listen to this, may love the Lord your God. That's first. Listen to his voice. And then hold fast to him. The key to experiencing this amazing life that God offers is to be intentional about pursuing my relationship with God. We're admonished to love, to listen, to hold fast to him. And so can I just remind you in this first session, that's your highest calling. That's your first priority. If you want to do ministry in a way that you don't lose your soul, you're going to have to learn to tend to your own soul. You're going to have to learn how to shepherd yourself. And that's going to come because you create unhurried space in your life and you integrate authentic spiritual practices. And there's discipline to that, but not for the sake of trying to prove how spiritual you are, but rather for the sake of actually connecting at a heart level with the Savior who you serve. I love the last six words of Deuteronomy 30. It's these six words. For the Lord is your life. It's not your ministry is your life. It's not your church is your life. It's not even your family is your life. You know what I get at age 59? Someday my ministry is going to go away. Like I realize I've got more ministry in the rearview mirror than I do in the windshield. I've got more behind me than in front of me. And someday somebody's going to take my spot. Somebody else is going to pastor your church. Someone else is going to move into your office. And they're going to take your business cards and throw them in the trash. And no matter how good you've been, they're going to find someone younger, skinnier, and with hair to do what you do. But here's my point. If you've been making it about your relationship with Jesus, it'll all be okay. Because your relationship with Jesus transcends your position. It transcends your role. It's the anchor and the identity with which you live your life. And if I can make that my highest priority, now I can do ministry out of the overflow of a love for Jesus. I can do ministry from that healthy place rather than from that empty place. So here, I want to give you, as we finish this session, a good question. And this, is a, this is a good soul care question, and I want you to sit with this question for just a moment right now. Here's the question. How is God coming to me right now? How is God coming to me right now? And with where you sit in your unique situation, in your ministry, how is it that God's coming to you? In this moment right now, what is he saying to you about where you sit, about tending your own soul, about your relationship with him? Not about your preaching, not about your, your, your church growth, but about you. How's he coming to you? 
right now. I want us to pray together, and um, then we're going to take a 30-minute break. Um, so if you'll come back here around uh, 10, 15, we will um, reconvene and we'll uh, move into our next session. All right, let's, let's pray together. Lord, in some ways, all this seems really simple. It's stuff that we tell brand new believers. And yet it's easy for us to get distracted ourselves. And I pray you take all of us back to those moments when you first called us, when we first met you, Our love for you back then, Lord, just seemed so simple, so pure. And something about getting into ministry just complicates all that. It becomes a job. It becomes a lot of pressure. We run an organization. We recruit volunteers. We manage budgets. And so, Lord, in the midst of all that, and it's not bad, but would you just remind us today that the greatest gift we give our own church is our own healthy soul. I pray that you would give us the courage in a very busy, fast-paced world to carve out time for unhurried moments with you. I pray that you would give us the passion to, to be disciplined, to make it both about habit and heart, to practice those disciplines, not as the litmus test of our spirituality, but simply the means by which we connect to you personally. So Lord, I pray that you'd help us to make whatever adjustments and recalibrations that we need to make so that we can be the people that you want us to be. Lord, we're in ministry because we love you. We want our lives to count. We want to see people in our communities come to Christ. Lord, I pray that above everybody else in the community, that when people encounter us, there would be the aroma of the presence of God that would mark our lives. That those quiet moments where we spend with you would so shape us that it just leaks out as we love people, as we minister to people, as we shepherd them. We want to do this well, Lord, and we want to finish well for your glory, and we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, see you back here in half an hour, okay?